There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who set me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me to the promised land. What a day. Glorious day that will be, what a day that will be, when my Jesus I shall see, when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. Oh, what a day, glorious day that will be. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Linda. That is going to be a glorious day. I'm getting closer to that day. Myself. We're looking for the rapture of the church, but if it doesn't happen pretty soon, I'm going to be raptured independently and individually. But it'll all be the same. It won't make a whole lot of difference. going to leave this body and take a, a plane air ride. Not an airplane ride, but a plane air ride. going to head right on up to heaven and uh, to be with the Lord. That's going to be a wonderful thing to do. It's kind of getting closer and closer. In fact, with every breath, it's closer than it was before. And that's true of you as well. Doesn't make any difference how old you are. You don't know how long you're going to stay in this world. Uh, you could be living your last moments even as we speak. And uh, and I've known some who over the years have gotten up and sung in a service kind of like today, sat down and departed uh, to another world. So I pray that's not going to happen to you today, especially if you're not ready to go. But if you're ready to go, it won't make a whole lot of difference. Just be sad for those that are left behind. I want to read this morning from uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Uh, a couple of services ago, I don't remember what it was, we had an interruption there by our Resurrection Day sermon, sermons and so on. And, and, uh, but I had started by preaching on a subject called Laying Hold on Eternal Life. It's found in 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to read 19 verses in that chapter and then speak to you some more on a little bit different uh, slant on that same statement that's made in the book of First Timothy. So if you have your Bibles and you opened up the First Timothy, we'll begin to read in verse 1. And the Bible reads like this, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they're brethren, but rather do them service because they're faithful and beloved Partaker, partakers of the benefit these things teach and exhort. 
If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he's proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which some, or which while some coveted after, they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he will show who is a blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Now I want to stop right there and call your attention back to the 19th division in this chapter, where it says, Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. And I want to speak again on that little statement, laying hold on eternal life. Lord, we ask your blessing today. Uh, Lord, I don't know who's watching this. Maybe no one. Maybe it's just me and you. But Lord, I pray you'll bless and meet the needs of those that are hearing and those that are seeing, those that are listening by radio or by the Internet or watching by Facebook or by YouTube, all these outlets, Lord, where we have to give out the Word of God. May you meet the needs of every person. Maybe some struggling today with confinement, uh, with the absence of things that they need because of being deprived of things in grocery stores. But Lord, you have everything under control. You know exactly what's going on. I pray you'll help us to keep our faith firmly fixed in you and your will. And you'll meet our needs. You promise you'd never leave us nor forsake us. And Lord, we know that's true. And I pray, Lord, you'll meet every need of every person within the sound of this voice, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're encouraged to seize eternal life. I mentioned in a previous message about eternal life that there are some privileges that you and I have who know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior that are come to us because we have received the gift of eternal life. And so we continue to be encouraged to seize, to grab hold of this thing called eternal life. And what a wonderful encouragement it is. There are many who need to see this as an invitation to receive the gift of life and to do it by faith. The Bible makes it very plain. If we get what we deserve, we're not going to be very happy. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. That's not a good news. That's a bad news. Uh, we're uh, living in a time when people are literally afraid of catching that little bug, that little COVID-19, because they think it just might bring to them this thing called death, and they might experience that. But I want to tell you, it's much worse than that when you have no Savior. You can go out of this world without a Savior. That death is a final death. It's finally being separated from God and all that's good for all of eternity. The Bible makes it very plain that the wages of sin is death, being separated from God for eternity. That's the wages of sin. That's not good news, but there is good news in that same statement. 
because it doesn't stop. There's a little word. It's a little three-letter word. It's called, uh, it's spelled B-U-T. We know that means the word but. When you read that little word but, you know things are going to change. It always changes when you read the word but. And so it says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And uh, if you're not sure you're going to heaven, if you haven't received this gift called eternal life, then that's your greatest need this morning, even as we're speaking. You ought not to hesitate about it. You ought to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and lay hold on that gift of eternal life. Now that word lay hold means to seize, to seize upon, to grab it, and to hold on to it. And we need to define eternal life. Just what is that? What does it mean to have eternal life? The definition is found in the Word of God. You don't have to travel very far in order to find the definition for eternal life. In the book of John, in the 17th chapter, that's really the Lord's prayer is found in there. In that chapter, in the third division, the third verse, it says, And this is life eternal, that they may, might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So the Lord said, here's how you have eternal life, is to know God, the true God, not a false God, not a God of your making, not a God of a lot of the uh, people around here who worship a God that's not the God of the Bible, but a God of their own making. They make him to suit whatever they want to do. But to know the God, the true God, the one who had this Bible pen for us so that we can know him in a very real way. So to know God is to know eternal life. And that word know is an important word. It means to have an intimate relationship with him. I, I remember reading in the book of Genesis, I think it's the chapter 4 and the first verse in there, and it says this about Adam. Adam, you remember, the first man and woman who peopled uh, this planet called Earth. And the Bible says that Adam knew his wife and she conceived. He knew her. That was an intimate thing. It's an intimate term to know in a very personal and intimate way. And this word is used to tell us that we need to know God. We didn't know Him in an intimate way. The Apostle Paul was concerned about that. He said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, we read these words. He said, That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. Vine, uh, in his uh, study notes says uh, eternal life is conscious existence in communion with God, being aware of Him and being in communion with Him at all the time. And when Paul told Timothy and others to lay hold on eternal life, he was encouraging them to seize all the privileges and all the rights and all the responsibilities that go along with having eternal life. And I want to think about what are the rights of eternal life. What are the rights of eternal life? Well, we first of all have a right to have it. Uh, there's not a people upon the face of the earth that do not have the right to eternal life. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, the Lord said this, Who will have all men to be saved? He will. He will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. Peter writes about it. He said, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll begin to read in verse 11, where Paul writes to the church at Corinth, and he says these words, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judged that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. I want you to know that the Lord Jesus Christ, when He hung on that cross, He hung in your place and in mine. And He took our, our payment, He took our debt, that sin debt that we owned, that sin debt that we earned, 
and he placed it upon himself and took that debt and paid for it in full. That's why I could say it is finished when he came to the close of that event. It is evident that the will of God is simply this, that everyone should be saved. There can be no other application for these scriptures. It's talking about Jesus dying for the world. You know one of the greatest words in all the Bible is the word whosoever. We read that word, you know, in John 3, 16, where the Bible said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not, have, should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, it's whosoever will believe. And so one of the greatest words I find in the Word of God is that word, whosoever. And it's derived from two words, which mean all who. Anyone who would trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their sin bearer is promised the gift of eternal life. That happened to me 55 years ago, maybe a little longer than that, when I was in a little place called Lewis Fetter, of Virginia. I'd moved there from Maryland to try to really turn my life around and become a person that I could be comfortable with, to be able to live in my own body comfortably and to treat my family right and so on. And uh, I made that move, and it cost something to make that move. And uh, the, it didn't take me long to ruin what I didn't have much of down there, which was a reputation. Almost the first day on the job, I ruined my reputation. And it's a long story, and I don't have time to tell it all. But I went home very discouraged that night. I was met by my mother-in-law as I got out of my uh, car at the automobile there in Lewisetta, Virginia. She said just simple words to me. She said, Tom, don't you want to go to church? And I really didn't want to go to church, but I was feeling so downcast and so low that without thinking, I replied and said, yes, I'll go. And I made about two steps from there, and I thought to myself, why do you want to do that? You don't want to go to church. But I had said I would, and I had uh, determined to change my character some, so I was going to keep my word. I remember going in my house, and I asked my wife where my Bible was. You see, my mother gave me a Bible when I was 21. I read what she wrote in the flyleaf of that Bible. I still have it back in Maryland. I still have that Bible she gave me, but that's all I ever read about it. My, my wife said to me, what do you want the Bible for? I said, I'm going to church tonight. I think she almost had a heart attack. But I went that night, walked in through the back door. There were wooden chairs in our auditorium back in those days, and you just move a little bit and they squeak and holler. And I sat right next to that door. I want to be able to make a fast exit. And I remember the preacher came from Maryland. Here I was in Virginia. I had left Maryland. But the preacher came from Maryland. His name was Dr. Donald McKnight. And he came. He's a special preacher, preaching revival message. And I'll be honest with you, I don't remember what he preached. I don't remember what the subject was. I don't remember even a, a word. But I do remember this. Whatever he was preaching, and I was preaching about being saved. Whatever, when he was preaching, I kept hearing a little voice in my head saying, you need that. You need that. That's what you need. But I wouldn't listen. It haunted me. And at the conclusion of that service, they gave an invitation for those that would like to trust the Lord Jesus Christ to respond and and walk down the aisle and let somebody open the Bible and show you how to be absolutely sure that when you die, you're going to go be with Jesus. But I wouldn't go. Pride would not let me go. I gripped the back of the chair in front of me. That wooden chair probably still has my fingerprints in it. And I went home that night. But all the way home, all I could think about is what I kept hearing. You really need what he was talking about. You need that. That was the Holy Spirit dealing with me. I remember that night we got together, had a little snack for the children, put them to bed. My wife and I had a snack, and then as we were getting ready to bed, my wife in fear turned to me and said, Tom, don't you want to pray? I never have answered her. I didn't need to answer her. I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. I dropped down to my knees, and I trusted Him, and I told Him about it. He already knew. I told Him about it, and I was a new man. God changed my life. God changed my character. Everything changed. Everything became new. Here's a wonderful thing. God wants you to have that same kind of experience, to trust Him as your Savior, to become a whosoever will may come, and to confess the fact you need Jesus as your Savior, 
and trust him with all your heart and he'll give you this salvation. You know, some want to grasp, to hold on to their sin. They want to keep their sin. And when they do, they forsake their salvation. Now, how foolish that is. You know, the Bible says, For what shall, a, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You look around, they'll do, just about to give everything. They'll give anything. Uh, that's the truth of it. It's foolish to keep something, uh, keep the, to hang on to things that will keep you from being saved that you can't keep very long and you'll end up being, being ushered from the presence of God for all of eternity. And that person who needs to be saved today, they need to lay hold of the promises of God and trust the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior. Lay hold on that eternal life. You have a right to it. You, you, you should lay hold on it to enjoy it. Oh, I think it's good to enjoy being saved. Now, we're living in tenuous times. We live in dangerous times. We don't really know what's going to happen. We're, we're wearing face masks, and somebody said, yeah, they used to arrest you for wearing a face mask, mask in, a, in a store, and now they arrest you if you don't wear one. And it's kind of true. So it's a little different out there today than it has been over the course of the years I've been alive. But I think we ought to enjoy it being saved. We ought to enjoy it because of God's Word. Tough, tough times are here. And they may get worse before they get better, and they may never, ever get better. But we shouldn't care too much about that. We can enjoy the fact that we're saved. There was an Old Testament prophet. There's a book in the Old Testament that carries his name. It's called Habakkuk. Habakkuk, he, he was living in a terrible time when the nation of God was away from him and living in a, in a terrible way. And God told Habakkuk what he was going to do. And the Bible said, the Bible reads it this way, that when Habakkuk heard, he said, uh, when I heard what God was going to do, he said, my belly trembled. My lips, my lips quivered at the voice. Uh, rottenness entered into my bones. And I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble when he cometh up unto the people. He will invade them with his troops. Although the fig tree, listen to what he said, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olives shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Here's what he said. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. You know, he can say that because that's a wonderful thing, being saved. No matter how bad things get, no matter how hard things may get here in the United States of America, no matter how hard it may get in whatever country you may be living in, if you know the Lord is your Savior, we've got a great reason to rejoice and to, and to uh, uh, praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because we've been saved and our ultimate, ultimate thing can happen to us is dying. You know, it's not a big problem for a person who knows the Lord is their Savior to die physically because that's not the end. It's only the beginning. The end of all of our strife is over. The end of our heartache is gone. The end of our pain is ceased. And we're going off to a place we call heaven to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where He is. He's promised that where He is, He'll bring us. And so we're going to be with Him. That's a marvelous thing to think about. The worst part about it is getting sick. Almost everybody has to get sick to die or to get injured some way or another. I don't like the thought of being sick or going through a lot of pain. But the end of it all will be a complete release from the troubles of this old world. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul, he speaks to the church there in Thessalonica. And he says to them in the church, he said, rejoice evermore. Just rejoice evermore. That means to rejoice forever and more. And I want to say, Christians, who do not enjoy their salvation, have a sin problem. They're trying to live in two different worlds, and they're not going to make it. David had a problem with sin. When you read about the life of King David, you'll learn David had a problem with sin like most of us do. And it was a bad problem. David had more than one problem with sin. One time he numbered the people, and thousands lost their lives because of his disobedience. Probably the worst sin that he did. It costs more than his other sin. 
We know when we think of David, we think of a woman whose name was Bathsheba. We think about his sin with her, adultery and, and murder, and all those things wrapped up in what David did in that case. That was not the worst thing. The worst was numbering the people. But here, he got right with God. He understood what he needed to do. And in the 51st Psalm, you read how he took care of that. He said in that Psalm, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Now I want to tell you, he said, I need to have my joy back. I need to get it again. I used to have joy, but I've lost it. My sin's gotten in the way. My guilt has gotten in the way. And I need to have that joy back. I want you to give it back to me, that joy of my salvation. I want you to give it back to me. And he got that joy back and served God with the rest of his life. You know, and, and God said about him, he was a man after his own heart. Somebody said, how can God say that about an adulterer and a murderer? Well, I tell you one thing, when David got right, he really got right. And he never was guilty of that anymore. He kept his faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We know him as a sweet psalmist, penned much of the Old Testament book, uh, the book of Psalms. And we love reading the book of Psalms. They're a comfort to our souls. And I want to say this to you. If you're going to enjoy your eternal life, then you must determine to live in the spiritual realm. Not in the realm of this world, but live in the spiritual realm. Living in the will of God for your life. Find out what He wants you to do and do it. There are generic things everybody's to do, but there are specific things that God probably wants you to do, and you need to learn what they are and then perform the doing of it. So enjoy it. That's, our, that's something we ought to do. Lay hold of eternal life. Lay hold of it by enjoying it. And then lay hold of eternal life by proclaiming it. Boy, it's something to be able to tell people that you're going to go to heaven when you die. This is not the end of things. This is just the end of this physical life on earth. But it's not the end of all things. We're going off to heaven. That's what eternal life means. I, I like the fact it's eternal. Somebody said, how long is it? eternity. Well, I said it already. It means forever and more. That only really make a whole lot of sense, does it? But it means forever and more. You can't really quantify eternal life. You can't really put a parameters around it because it has no ending. It just goes on and on and on and on. Now, I'm a little older than I used to be. In fact, I'm older now than I was when I started this message. And uh, I've been around for a few years. And, I, I, you know, this, it's fleeting. I want to tell you right now, it's a, no matter how old you may be, you may think you haven't lived very long, but when you get to be my age, you'll, see, you'll say the same thing. I haven't lived very long. I read about a 93-year-old woman. All she could think about was getting another beer. How sad that was. She was leaning out her window and saying, I, I, just somebody, I, I need another beer at 93 years of age. And a beer company brought her some beer. I thought, no, that's not what she needed. What she needed was not that kind of spirit. What she needed was the Holy Spirit. What she needed was to get saved because her days are really clawing, claw, coming to a, a close pretty soon. You and I, who have eternal life, we need to learn to proclaim it, to tell people that Jesus saves. That's a wonderful thing. Uh, I learned this a long time ago. Whatever a person feels strongly about, that's what they talk about. If you like football, if that consumes your life, whenever you get together with somebody else, you'll bring up the subject of football. If, if you like fishing, if you get together with some of your buddies or some of your, co, your uh, co-workers, you'll start talking about fishing. I see some on Facebook every once in a while. One of my friends, he's a great fisherman. He loves fishing. When he posts something on Facebook, he usually when he posts a picture of a big fish, he loves fishing. He talks about fishing. Whatever you really consume with, that becomes a topic of your conversation. But when you're saved, you ought to be consumed with the fact that Jesus loved you and died for you. That he gave you eternal life. And uh, that life is in his son. And it ought to consume your thoughts and consume your time. And it ought to be the subject of your conversation no matter where you go. I remember... I don't know, my sister may be listening to this. But I remember years ago that I went to visit my sister. One's still living. I had two. One's already gone. 
And uh, in our conversation, she said this to me. Can you, not, can you not talk to me without talking about the Bible? I said, well, I can't. I can't. And it ended our conversation. Because that was consuming me. I was in the Word of God. I was studying the Word of God, reading the Word of God, thinking about the Word of God, learning the Word of God. And so wherever I want, I want to talk about God's Word, knowing God and knowing His Word. So whatever you're consumed with is going to be the subject of your conversation. If you're saved today, then that ought to be the easiest thing in the world for you to do is to talk about how you got saved. It will consume you. Lay hold of eternal life. The Lord wants us to lay hold, to seize it, to use it for our benefit and the benefit of others. And if we're going to lay hold of eternal life, then we need to learn to enjoy all the privileges and rights that we have in Christ Jesus. That's for all of us. You may be listening today or watching, and you're not sure heaven's your home. People are dropping off pretty fast. They say it's because of the COVID-19. Well, I'm not sure that's the cause of all of it. But regardless of that, there's something maybe lacking, lacking already in, I should say lacking. There's something you already have in your, bi in your body that might end up killing you. It could be COVID-19, but it may be the flu. It could be something else. It could be clogged arteries. I, I don't know. It could be an aneurysm. I've known healthy people, I mean, really vigorously active people who died from a hemorrhage in their brain, an aneurysm that burst at 35 years of age. He was a, he was a very young man, a very vigorous young man who, who had uh, had been in the military and been in a very important part of the military. But he didn't know about that. What I'm saying to you, there's something you might already have that's going to take you from this world. You don't know, and I don't know, and the doctors don't know. Only God really knows. But if, it's, if you're ready to go, it doesn't make a blessed bit of difference. Because this life is temporary at best. And if you're ready to go, you're looking forward to eternal life, which you've spoken about quite a bit today. I trust you'll, tr you'll trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Get it straightened out with God. Don't take my word for it. Get in the Bible. See what the Bible says. Just read the, the, the Gospel of John. Ninety-nine times in that little book, you, you'll read the word believe, believe us or believing. Most of the time it's talking about how to be saved. Uh, we already mentioned John 3.16. That, that's number one on everybody's hit parade. And it talks about believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and being saved. I encourage you to do that. Maybe you're watching this program, listening to this program. You're not sure about what I've said, but there's something in you that's kind of piqued your interest and you'd like to know a little bit more. I would encourage you to write us. Let us know. We'll help you. We can send you some literature that will help you. And our address you'll find at the end of this video broadcast. And you'll, I'm going to tell you what it is, 3794 Oleander Avenue in Fort Pierce, Florida. I think it's three more. 34982 is a zip code. You write us. We'll get something to you, help you. You can look us up on the internet and find our phone number, and you can call us, and we'll be able to talk to you on the phone. We want to help you if we can. We want to glorify our Savior, and we do that by telling others about what He did for us. I trust that will help you today. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for those who would spend their time listening or watching. Lord, may you bless this message. May it meet, reach the heart of the hearers. May they turn from their sin and turn to you and receive the gift of eternal life. We'll thank you and praise you for what you're going to do. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.